back on the podcast. So happy to be joined by Pro Football Focus, PFF Vice President of Research and Development, Eric Eager. Eric, before we start on football, I want you to tell me your very strange path to join oh. Pro Football Focus. Where were you and how did you get to Cincinnati, Ohio, home of the PFF empire? Yeah, I was a, a math, college math professor for six years. Um, I taught, you know, all kinds of uh, statistics, differential equations, uh, linear Where? algebra. University of Wisconsin Lacrosse, which is the uh, alma mater of Green Bay Packers general manager Brian Gutekunz, um, and I think a few other players. I I, I believe can't remember which NFL team had their training camp there until they all sort of started to have them the Saints. locally. The Saints. Saints. There you go. Yeah. So. Uh, a very fun place to live. And then I, I found myself, you know, this sounds silly, but like a little bit bored. And I started working on football and then, uh, you know, um, you know, one comes after the other and, and, uh, and here we are. Yeah. Great. Um, I am sort of fascinated by PFF because uh, my brother uh, who lived in England at the time uh, was a coworker of Neil Hornsby's wife. And he would always tell me, hey, I, I work with a woman who's, whose husband is just this absolute, total, all in NFL fan who spends all of his time watching these games and dissecting everything. And, and he, he tells me sometimes, oh, Peter, Peter is wrong about this player or that player. And, and my brother used to say, I really think he's crazy, but he's really into it. You ought to talk to him one time. And when I talked to him, I found out he's not crazy. He's watching every snap of these games and watching how every player plays. And he was really ahead of his time. Uh, and I think PFF is the coolest thing. I, I think over the years, PFF has really gotten uh, beat up by some people who – claim to and in many cases do really know football but i don't think pff ever says that when we look at every play that a right tackle plays that we know exactly what his assignment is but we can see if he gets beat around the corner and he's flailing at some guy and misses him that's his fault or we can see when a guy stones tj watt give him credit for that and I think over the years, I think it's been borne out. Uh, and I first think of Evan Mathis, the guard who I think is the first guy who really made a lot of money because of PFF. You know, he ended up getting a good contract from Denver, I think in 2015, uh, in part because of his PFF rating. But anyway, I, I just, I think it's a fascinating way to look at the game, to separate every play into 22 bits and to look at all 22 players and how they did on that play. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Neil certainly, uh, you know, set, set the tone and sets the tone um, for, you know, what it's like to be obsessed about the game. And, um, you know, and I think, uh, you know, all of us are sort of that way. And, and I know you're that way, Peter, and it, it's, it's, it's borne out in the work that everybody does in the industry. And I agree. I think like we just come at it from a different perspective. I think, uh, you know, I, I probably, I think I speak for everybody at PFF when I say that we have a ton of respect for people within the league, for people in media who look at it differently. Um, you know, ultimately, though, we've all begun to work together more. And so the, I think the reasonable criticism that we don't know everybody's assignment, I think that that has gone away somewhat over the years um, because of all, I mean, we're clients with all 32 NFL teams. So right. we, we can certainly ask the question when, when things come up. Um, and yeah, things have, you know, I think the way that we talk about football has changed. And I, and I think that we, you know, I think that the media, you know, and, and us, and, and we've all become smarter and we've all become smarter in our own way. And, and I think hopefully we, we deserve some credit for that. Can I ask you, I want to ask you three questions about game situations and what I see right now. I, I want to ask you about the Monday night game this week. Uh, where the Patriots ran it 46 times, they passed it three times. And when I'm watching this game, 
I was reminded of, of an old Bill Parcells team in the 80s when after one of these games, and I forget who it was against, um, he admitted they only had four run plays, period. That's all mm-hmm. they had in their playbook. He said, we're such an easy team to both play for and to play against. We show you exactly what's coming. And I think last night, you know, as, as we record this on Tuesday, I think last night, Bill Belichick essentially said the same thing. We're not disguising anything. We're not hiding anything. We are going to play a land battle. That's all this game is. It's not going to be who's got, you know, the best trick play or, or whether Josh McDaniels has, has anything up his sleeve. In fact, Belichick said something really cool on, on the radio on Tuesday morning in Boston. And that is that, you know, what are the advantages that you see right now? Game and a half lead on Buffalo coming into the bye week. Patriots have a huge edge right now. But he said they have not seen anything in our passing game with Mac Jones. We didn't show him anything that we thought would work against him. We practiced it, but it was futile, you know, in a game like mm-hmm. that. So, I, you know, I'm curious. What did you think of the game? What did you think of the strategy? Well, I think the strategy was fairly smart given the situation, right? I, you don't have, you know, yeah, I don't think Mac Jones has got a weak arm, but you don't have a guy with the arm uh, of Josh Allen. Um, and your the, the strategy thing makes sense when, when you're looking at it. I, I sort of think about this too when I look at Sunday night's game. Everybody's like, oh, Kansas City's kind of sputtering offensively. And it's like, well, when your defense is playing that well and you know you can beat Denver playing a, a three out of 10 game on offense – you know, you just kind of, you know, you're not playing the good plays. And I think with New England kind of did that last night, they got a little lucky, obviously, with, you know, Diggs dropping the touchdown pass, you know, the field goal yeah. miss on the penultimate drive meant that the, the, the Bills couldn't kick a field goal on their last drive. Um, but you're right. I mean, the, the thing of it, and there was an article that I wrote on PFF.com last week that looked at the difference between perfectly blocked run plays and, and run plays with one negative block or more. And, Basically, the difference, if you add it up, is about half a point difference. And so when, when I hear somebody like Belichick say, we only have like four or five run plays, it's music to my ears a little bit. Because as somebody who played, you know, I played through college, I was a tight end. I, I saw the look on my face, on the, on the coach's face when everything was blocked up perfectly, right? Those plays are the best plays in football. The problem is it's really hard to get five or six or seven, depending upon what your front looks like blocks to all work at once. And I think it makes it easier when you have fewer run plays to execute, right? It's just about execution. And I think last night, you know, it was parts the the New England Patriots just executed better. And then it's part the fact that, and this is why Belichick is who he is and why he's the best. The Bills have been engineering their defense for almost a year and a half now to beat the Chiefs. And that's why you've seen them struggle with teams like Indianapolis and teams like New England, because they are not built to stop an offense like that. And what we got last night was the true extreme uh, of, you know, a team being forced to run the ball all the time and a team being forced to stop the run all the time. And, and, you know, even though the Patriots only scored 14 points, um, you know, it was, it it ended up being enough to win. I want to ask you whether, this year in the NFL feels different to you. Um, And I don't just ask that because the 13 seed in the AFC as of this morning has six wins and the fifth seed in the AFC has seven. So it's going to be a ridiculous rollicking last month of the season. But I ask because of something I wrote about this week in my column, and that is teams' almost newfound penchant of going forward more liberally on fourth down, particularly in minus territory, in their own territory. How much do you think over the last few years the game has changed, and why do you think it has? Well, I I think it just takes – and they have, they've, they've gone for fourth downs a lot more. Um, I think that it just took a few coaches to go against the trend 
and to have success, right? Because we see this in all walks of life. If you're in a rarefied air, if you're one of 32 people who have an elite job and you want to keep it for long, the longest time, right? So like one example I have, and this is a person who's sort of connected to the Evan Mathis story, but also the PFF story. So Chip Kelly went, what was it, 20 and 12 in his first two years in, in Philly with Nick Foles and Mark Sanchez as his quarterbacks. And the moment he, he started, what, six and nine in 2014 and he was or 15 and he was fired, right? He didn't even get, like, he had a winning record as a coach and he got swept out right away because he thought differently than everybody else. And so, you know, here's a person who had, I, I thought, very good ideas who played, was a little bit different. And the moment he messed up, he was kind of, he was removed from Philadelphia and then subsequently San Francisco. It's, it's more advantageous for the truly rarefied people in any field to fail slowly and with the pack, right? And there's no, to me, fourth down decisions are such where, let's say you're down. So I, I think of that, that first Chargers game against the Ravens where they went for and missed two fourth downs in their own end and they lose by 28, right? Like, to me, it takes a coach saying, look, if we're going to lose this game, I don't care if we lose by 28 or we lose by seven. Right. It's a loss is a loss. And I think that more coaches have made that behavior acceptable. And so they're doing the right thing. They're, they're, they're failing quickly or they're succeeding. And we saw, you know, with, with uh, the Chargers, they've had as many games where the fourth down decisions they've gone for have helped them win games that they were underdogs in, namely Kansas City on the road in week three. Um and so I think it, I think it took a Doug Peterson. I think it took a, you know, I think it took Bill Belichick in 09 against the Colts. I think it takes, um, you know, these, these coaches to be like, it's okay to do this. This is acceptable behavior now. And if you lose, you can write it off to the rest of the league. Right. Whereas before, if you punted in those situations and it was the bad decision, you could write it off to the rest of the league. The thing that I like about this approach is that, when you think about how logical it is to go for it on fourth and two in your own territory early in the second quarter of a game that you're down 14 points in, in a game in which the opposition, meaning Cleveland, I'm talking the Chargers, just went 75 yards in five plays. Your defense is gassed. Your defense is confused. Um, putting them back on the field immediately is probably an invitation to disaster. So even if you don't make the fourth and two in your own territory and give the Browns a short field, I absolutely see a hundred percent why a coach would do something like that. Yeah. And it's borne out in the numbers, as you said, because like the thing is <laughs> being down, as you said, being down 14 means you're probably the worst of the two teams. Right. And so you'd rather, take and, and this is similar we'll talk about I think the Baltimore uh, Pittsburgh decision to go for two but it's like you'd rather play one play against a team that's better than you than play a bunch of them right and, and kicking the ball back to the Browns in the case of the Chargers in whatever week that was that that's essentially what they're choosing to do and if you're down by 14 like I said you're probably the worst of the two teams and so you end up playing just a better numbers game I'd rather play one hand of blackjack if I'm not counting cards than 100 because I know the casino has the edge over me in that. And, and, and like, that's how, that's how, that's how we sort of think. Right. And, and old coaching would just sit at the table and lose the 1% an hour. You know, I find myself often thinking about what's new in football. And one of the things now that I look at that's new is the ability of every coach and most coaches now to treat game plans the way Belichick has treated them for years, which is that every game plan is a snowflake. And, and I ask this question broadly, okay? Do you find that when you're looking at the 32 teams, do you find that there are fewer times when you say, man, I'm shocked, uh, you know, Mike McCarthy did this in Dallas. I didn't expect him to to run that much, or, or I'm shocked at this. Do you think coaches in terms of their game plans are a little harder to read right now? I think so. And I think that the league is also just, and this is actually something I measure on a weekly basis, but I, I think that the league 
um, you know, there are just more unique schemes, right? Like one week you're taking on McVay, Shanahan. The other week you're taking on like a Kubiak-like offense. Um, you know, I think the, to me, I think that that's, that's kind of, that's kind of the thing, right? Like where you have just a, a, a group of the schemes are so different, right? And then playing off of them, you know, and, and we're also seeing, I think, just a, a, a really good, um, you know, collection of, I think, teams that are trying to beat these super teams, sort of, you know, being more creative and being more willing to sort of fail again to the point that you're saying where that's why you're getting so many upsets in the NFL. That's why you get Denver versus Dallas uh, out of Dallas's by. Um, that's why you get Jacksonville. And I, you know, all this stuff is noisy, but that's why you get some of this. And it's also why, in my opinion, you're seeing execution not quite as good in the NFL, right? Like you're getting, um, you're getting essentially like some teams just have off weeks and, and they lose to teams they shouldn't lose to. I think that's because teams don't necessarily, and I, I don't mean this in a negative sense, but they have less of an identity, right? When, when your game plan is like every single week different, the players have to adjust to that. And, and we've seen with the new CBA with practice times and all that kind of COVID and all this stuff, like it's just hard to accomplish. So it, does, it makes the league more unpredictable, which I think most people think is fun. But when, if you're a fan of a team like Buffalo or Kansas City or Tennessee or Dallas or Green Bay, like that's how you see the stinkers. It's not the stinkers right. because necessarily the physical nature of the team is better, but it's because the team has to sort of run out a new script every time they play. I'll end with this. Who's the best player in the NFL who no one knows is a great player and why? Say that. Sorry, again. say that again. Who's, right. who's the best player in the NFL that people don't think of as a great player? Oh, that's a good question. Um, okay, so he plays for Green Bay. And I think he's been this good for a long time. I think Adrian Amos, the safety for Green Bay, is the best player that no one really talks about. Um, when I look at that team, you know, everybody asks, you know, underneath every single team that's like, hey, how are they this good? And we don't see it add up. There's always a player like Adrian Amos. And in Buffalo, it was Jordan Poyer, Micah High, right? And like a lot of times it's a safety, but I think in Green Bay, you know, you're, you're seeing the things stay together because of guys like Adrian Amos. Really good. Eric Eager, thanks so much for joining me. Have a great week and enjoy the games. Thanks for having me on, Peter. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.